Hi guys, uh, welcome to part two of the uh, video on how to take current readings from your electrostatic generator. Uh, back in the uh, beginning in the uh, Microsoft whiteboard presentation, I talked about running the machine at 3000 RPM and uh, based on the formula and my, uh, my own machine, uh, we came up with uh, something like 925 uh, microamps we could, were supposed to be able to get out of the machine uh, going at 3,000 RPM. Found out a couple of things. Uh, one of the, one of the mach things about these disk type generators that you'll notice, unlike a uh, DC generator or a DC alternator or an AC alternator, uh, when you don't have a load on the machine, these machines load up quite a bit and there's a lot of friction and it's hard to get them moving fast especially on a dry day uh, i live in the desert climate so uh except for two months of the year it's pretty dry uh 80 degrees outside and inside it's uh, like walking across the uh, carpet in uh, new england where i grew up in the winter uh so uh static uh build up is really high this machine loads up without a load on it quite a bit and uh, it's a bit difficult to get it to go up to 3,000 RPM, uh, whereas if it has a load on it, I could get it to go up almost 4,000 RPM. So I uh, redid my calculations uh, with 2,000 RPM instead of 3,000 RPM. Uh, it came up to 33 and a third uh, revolutions per minute instead of the 50. And we came up with something like 616 microamperes instead of the 925 or so. Uh, so what we're going to be looking for when we start taking uh, tachometer readings on the machine here uh, is to be at around 2000 RPM and we're going to see if we get close to the 600, uh, 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 600 microamps out. We're not going to look for 616 because I don't have enough resolution on my meters to even read a 16, uh, 16 microamps. Uh, so that's that. Initially, when we start taking readings, I'm just going to take readings at different speeds so you can see uh, how the uh, speed uh, directly affects the current output and seriously affects the current output. Uh, as I said, the uh, rotational speed uh, and uh, output current are directly proportional to each other. And on the table here, you'll see a bunch of meters. One is this $5 multimeter. And one is a little of the uh, more expensive end of the uh, Chinese multimeters. Actually, Exectech makes pretty decent meters. This is a pretty good one. I have a bunch of different models. Some of them are uh, uh, way upwards of uh, over $100 and some, uh, you know, $30 to $40. I don't remember if this is a $40 one or $120 one, but it's, it's, a, it's quite a decent meter. The only reason they're here is because... The cheaper ones, like this $5 ones, are even more sensitive. They get anywhere near this machine, they're dead. You can't use it for anything useful in what we're talking about. Uh, so don't even think about it. Uh, and you probably shouldn't even own one of those machines. But And this machine, a lot of people say, hey, we're just taking current. I got a really nice current loop. This one has a AC-DC current loop on it, not just AC like a lot of them. A lot of them will have an AC and a DC current loop. And... Uh, you might be able to get up to 100 amps or more. This one is 400 amps on AC. And then you go look at the DC side and it says 2 amps. Uh, this one is 400 amps on both AC or DC. Someone might say, well, I got that. I'm just going to take a really nice insulated wire or some of this 100,000 volt high voltage wire I have here. And I'm going to hook it up to the machine. I'll cap off one of the ends so it's not spitting out corona. And I'll put this around that, uh, making sure it's far enough away from the machine not to kill my machine and I'll get current readings and they're right you will get current readings uh, you'll probably destroy your meter pretty quickly anyway but you'll get current readings the problem is is these meters are designed to go at 40 uh, 50 and 60 uh, Hertz uh, I've had a uh, really high end of the uh, Home Depot sold uh, uh, Klein tools meters that actually said in the specs it goes up to a kilohertz I've also owned flukes really, really, really expensive flukes that said they go up slightly over two kilohertz. Uh, none of those meters uh, can read current if you can prevent them from getting killed from the high voltage. Uh, because these machines, uh, Wimshurst and Bonetti machines, especially on a motorized unit like this, at the lowest speed I can get any kind of output from this machine, I get about 10 kilohertz signal coming off the machine. At the highest speed I can get this running at, I get about 100 kilohertz. 
no way in hell if you can get this meter to read current without dying that you're going to be able to get anything accurate. You're going to get readings that make the thing look like it's putting out 3,000 watts with only 50 or 60 watts in and you're going to be jumping around the internet saying that you've created a perpetual motion machine. Neither is true. Don't use it. Don't put this machine, uh, whether it's a $40 meter, $4 meter, or $4,000 meter, don't put it anywhere near your machine. It's useless. So what you need to measure current on these machines are these panel meters. They're uh, analog panel meters, no electronics whatsoever in it. It has a little, uh, a little coil solenoid, and that's the way they work. Uh, this meter here, this Simpson, the black and white meter here, See if I got that, let me get that in the video here. Let's see if we can get that in better. Okay, this this Simpson meter, I consider the holy grail of uh, microamp panel meters. I highly re recommend anybody with a Wimshurst or a Benetti machine get one or any of the, uh, the so-called uh, 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 influence style machines. Uh, or if you have a very wide band uh, uh, generator, uh, your typical uh, your typical Wimhurst machines with a rather narrow belt, uh, even a pretty good three foot machine. You, if you really, 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 really know what you're doing, you can get them to go up 25, even 30 microamps. Usually, not much more. Uh, it depends on your top load and so on. But uh, if you start doing wide belt machines where you have like foot wide belts or bigger. You'll get output similar to these things, some, some even more, and this meter may not be enough. This meter here is not enough for this machine, even at the uh, 2000 RPM that we're talking about, but I still recommend having it for two reasons. One is these uh, panel meters, these analog panel meters, they're, they're polarized, and if you turn any of them over, usually you'll have at least one of the poles labeled. In this case, it's the minus pole on this particular meter. Uh, if you connect them backwards and you start reading, uh, you'll see the meter go past zero and, and uh, kind of get stuck. Uh, so you have to reverse the polarity. This one, your zero reading is in the middle. And if you reverse the label polarity on the machine or because you don't know what your polarity of your machine is, it'll still read because it will read in either direction based on the polarity that's connected. So I like it for that reason. Also, if this was the only meter you had, you can still read a machine that's putting out more than the 500 microamps that this meter will read. And the reason you can do that is if you check the internal resistance with your own meter, you'll find that these meters typically have about 50 ohm internal resistance. I think this one is about 48, but let's just say it's 50. For example, say if I were to add 50 ohms in series with this meter, now instead of it being a zero to 500 microamp meter, I have a 500 to one milliamp. Uh, meter. So that's the way you can measure over 500 microamps with a meter designed only for the 500 microamps. If you're doing a lot of Wimshurst machine testing and other very low current uh, devices, I recommend getting a uh, meter that goes something like 0 to 100 microamps max because uh, if you look at this meter in here that goes up to 500, you'll see that the graduations are roughly uh, 25 uh, microamps each. So if you have a machine that produces 25 microamps and less, you're not going to really be able to read much on this type of meter because it's just overkill. If you have a machine like mine that can easily bury the needle on this machine as is, uh, you might want to go look at a small milliamp meter like this one, which goes from zero to two milliamps. Uh, and if you look at the graduations, they're roughly uh, 100 microamp uh, increments. Uh, so that'll work for reading off this big machine when it's growing pretty fast. Uh, as far as pricing, the typical retail price of this meter is usually brand new inventory that's really old. Uh, there are people that specialize in selling these. This particular Simpson, I think, goes for about $80. I think I paid $80 for this one with shipping and everything uh, back when I was in the U.S. I, I bought another one before this one. Same exact meter, I think I paid $20 brand new, but all the inventory as well. Off an auction, I got it for about $20. So this can vary, this can get a little expensive if you pay $80. These meters are all Chinese. I bought them from China directly here to Jerusalem, Israel, where I live. And uh, I think the shipping was a dollar or something very inexpensive and they came extremely quickly. 
And these uh, zero to two milliamp meters were the most expensive. I think I paid two dollars and fifty cents each. Uh, this microamp meter, which is a, a single polarity uh, zero to five hundred microamp meter, I think I paid a dollar fifty each. I think I paid uh, almost as much for shipping as the meter cost. Uh, and they, I thought they wouldn't work, and uh, because uh, the uh, if you look at the uh, oh, it's not in, let me get this in. I realize we're not even looking at them. Second here, we'll zoom in. So these small, I was talking about these small meters down here. Uh, as you can see on the left, I have the zero to two milliamp meter. And on the right, I have the zero to 500 uh, um, uh, microamp meter. Uh, so the zero to two, the zero to two milliamp meter, of course, you're talking uh, zero to 2000 microamps. And the one on the right is a zero to 500. But again, it's single polarity as opposed to the Simpson, which uh, you can polarize in either direction. Uh, now, if you look back at the Simpson, you'll notice I have two, uh, let's see if we can get this into focus for you. You notice I have two meters attached to a piece of a PVC pipe. Uh, and uh, one is the Simpson and one is the uh, Chinese zero to two milliamp meter. The reason they're on the uh, PVC pipe is because when you're doing these readings, the meter cannot be at ground, and the table to the machine looks like ground uh, when it's running. Even though uh, if you have a wooden frame and wood anywhere on your machine, typically, your table is well above ground, but it looks like ground to the machine, and the meter will not work if it's anywhere near anything that's grounded, and if it's anywhere near your work table, it won't work. It has to be insulated from your work table, so I happen to have these pieces of two-inch uh, Schedule 40 American PVC pipes here. You can't even get white schedule 40 in this country, which is a shame, but uh, I had them laying around and that's what I used. I attached them to a two by four, as you can see, uh, as a stand. Uh, and I uh, hot glued the Simpson to one of them and I, uh, I just capped on taped the little Chinese uh, zero to two uh, milliamp meter to the other two. You'll notice on my uh, little meter, I have wires hooked up. I don't have it on the Simpson now because I'm going to use the smaller meter. But you'll notice this fat red wire uh, hooked up to it. And this fat red wire might be confused with this stuff. Uh, this stuff is uh, regular ignition wire. The, uh, uh, it's the resistor ignition wire uh, that you typically see attached to your spark plugs from old distributor cat cars and even on new cars. Uh, it's attached to the elect, you know, from the uh, ignition system to the uh, spark plugs. Uh, this stuff doesn't have a center wire. It has a uh, piece of uh, threaded nylon kind of thread wrapped around with a piece of vinyl, uh, conductive vinyl sleeve. It's very hard to attach to anything. And it's also, I, I think the maximum voltage rating on most of these is about 40,000 volts. I found that these work best if you have uh, wire that can with insulation that can handle the uh, high voltages you're working with if not if you're using regular wire you only have regular wire you have to at least down towards the bottom end where you're going to be connecting you have to have uh, uh, maybe a, a plastic tube or something over it to uh, keep the uh, corona from coming out of the two wires uh, as you attach them to the machine because it will seriously affect your ability to get any kind of reading at all uh, almost like you have the meter down on a grounded table or something so I found this helps a lot. I also found that you want to keep the poles sort of insulated from each other. That's why uh, if you look at the poles on this little unit, I have a small European, uh, this is the European answer to, uh, to the American wire nut. Uh, they come in all different sizes. I have really fat big ones that I hook up to the Simpson meter when I'm using it. I have these small ones. Uh, it turns out that they provide enough isolation from the poles to work. I don't know why it still works when I have a lot of the uh, high voltage wire here exposed. It's working just fine. Uh, so we'll go with it. Uh, hasn't been a problem. Uh, also, you'll see there's a little piece of uh, wire and, and uh, heat shrinked tubing connected across the poles. This is optional, but it's a very good idea. What's in here is a, uh, it's a, uh, 
hundred nanofarad or tenth of a microfarad uh, capacitor. Uh, this one happens to be one of those polyester film type capacitors. Uh, use anything but a uh, polarized or even an unpolarized electrolytic capacitor. Stay away from that. Uh, the purpose of this is uh, if you were to get a burst of high enough current, you could actually melt the wires inside or at least melt the insulation off the wires. This should prevent against that. It's a recommendation from Dr. Antonio uh, uh, Quiros back when he was around uh, as a good idea to protect your meter. It does work. I've used it with and without it. It, it works fine, but uh, it's, it's not a bad idea to have this. Again, it's about a tenth of a microfarad. This one happens to be a thousand volts because that was the highest voltage I can find. The voltage, especially if it's a metalized film, uh, or, uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, but I decided to get the highest voltage I could find, and this is a thousand volts, and it works just fine, and it does its job. All right, now to the machine. Uh, I talked about a lot of things in the uh, first part of the video. One of the things I mentioned is that when you have a, a Bonetti machine or a Wimsarch machine, a lot of people think that they're getting uh, twice the output current that you get from one disc because they got the two discs. Uh, I said that that's not the case. Uh, you don't get any more typically out of a Wimsource or but uh, uh, than you would from a uh, maybe like a Toppler Holtz machine, which has the one non-movable induction plate and the one spinning disc. And the reason is is because typically your uh, charge collectors, which are over here on my machine, are typically uh, symmetrical. They're dead center one exactly behind the other and you wind up with one disc uh, uh, providing all the current and the other disc just acting as an induction plate when they're when they're completely even uh, in this case you see i have one angled down and uh, angled to the nearest neutralizer let's see if we can get that on film here on, uh, on camera here so here's the nearest neutralizer and uh, Here's my uh, charge collector. You see it's angled down to the nearest neutralizer. And if you look at the other side, that one's angled up because the nearest neutralizer is up. The other one behind it is angled down and they alternate. Uh, because I'm doing that, I'm getting current off of all my discs. And I, I mentioned that this was a quadruple Bonetti, not a single machine. So here's a disc pair, here's a disc pair, here's a disc pair, and here's a disc pair. So I got four full disc pairs and I also mentioned in the video that normally you would think you have four machines connected in parallel which is this essentially is you're getting four times the current output I mentioned that you get quite a bit more the reason is because as you can see each section is fairly close as close as I can get them and still fit the neutralizers and uh, I mean the charge collectors and the neutralizers inside uh, because they're so close you get a shielding effect just from the proximity of the plates. You also get uh, the opposing charges on the kind of uh, keep the uh, electrons from flowing out all over the place like they normally do uh, and kind of slows that down. That's why you get you know, on a Benetti, on a sector waste machine, you get four, uh, uh, four times IMAX, as I mentioned in my calculations. So this is four times IMAX, six disks, four times IMAX. So the total inside of yet six discs producing four times IMAX. And then I know I mentioned because it's a Benetti machine and they're much more efficient than Wimsource machines on the outside disc, which is a two disc, you get two times IMAX. So giving you a total of 28 times IMAX total current output. Uh, part of the reason that you get more out of the Benetti than you do on the Wimsource is uh, that we're not taking account in that formula that there's a lot of space between your uh, sectors on a Wimsource and, and that empty space is just empty space. It's not used for charge collection. Uh, I think Anthony uh, Quiros on his site ha had and still has a, uh, a uh, little uh, Windows program that you can download. I think it's called something like Warp or something like that. But uh, you can put in the dimensions of your Wormhurst you're building, how many sectors, what the sector shape and spacing is. And it will actually do a fairly good job of giving you the exact current you're supposed to be able to get out of that machine because uh, he's really taking into account the dimensions of the uh, sectors and the space between them, which he's not doing in that formula. So that might be helpful to you. 
if you, like I said, if you go to the site, which I have a link for, and go to his electrostatic machines, you should be able to find that somewhere. Uh, he also has a section, I think it's in the beginning of his electrostatic machine pages, uh, called pseudoscience uh, testing and experimentation or something like that. Uh, just look up pseudoscience when you go to the main electrostatic page. Uh, in there, he talks about taking current readings. And like I said, I've done this uh, uh, many times. Uh, I've read about people doing, they never explained how they did it. He actually does. He actually also talks about some of the problems with measuring current off of these things that you might run into. One of the things you run into is a lot of people have machines that if they're dead shorted, that's it. Machine shuts down and not, will no longer produce any output until you remove the dead short and start it up again. Uh, this machine, fortunately, can be dead shorted uh, fine. If you do have a machine that's dead, won't run dead shorted, it's usually because you have a serious problem with your neutralizers, usually a problem with uh, connectivity between the two halves of your neutralizers or, or some other neutralizer issue uh, or your angle is too steep uh, between your neutralizers. Uh, but if you can't fit, find the problem or you can't fix the problem, you're unwilling to fix the problem, you can still get great current readings off the machine. You would just be taking your current off of one pole and grounding the other end or connecting the one the uh, other end that, uh, to the uh, any of the neutralizers uh, will usually work. So you can go between any of the pole high voltage poles and a neutralizer or any of the high voltage poles in the ground or a direct dead short if your machine can handle a dead short. In uh, our testing, we're going to do dead shorting directly across the two poles of the uh, machine. Uh, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. Also, I talked about current readings, and we uh, did the formula for current readings at a specific uh, speed. Uh, I, I mentioned that originally we we're going to go at 3,000 RPM. Now I decided to do it at 2, uh, and we calculated this machine at uh, 2,000 RPM should be kicking out something like 616 microamps. At 3,000 RPM, something like 925 microamps. Uh, so we're going to see if we get anywhere near that. Uh, that's number one. Number two is how we're going to find out how fast the machine's moving. Well, those of you who've watched my uh, uh, postings and my videos probably remember when this machine was originally had discs made out of vinyl records like this one. Now, if you notice, the vinyl record is black, like all vinyl records tend to be. Although there are other colors, but mine were black. Uh, I have one of these uh, digital tachometers here. This is actually one of the better Chinese-made digital tachometers. Highly recommend it. It's a Unity uh, UT373. I like it a lot, but the way these uh, optical tachometers work, they have a laser light that shines out of them, and a laser light needs to be pointed at a, a piece of reflective uh, tape that you stick on to your rotating device you want to uh, actually read the uh, speed of. Uh, I didn't realize when I started making this video that, oh, I switched to these white acrylic discs. The white acrylic discs are actually more reflective than the, uh, than the reflective tape, so you can't get a reading at all off of them. But I found, I started seeing if I could mask it in dark tape or something like that and get it to work. But then I found if I uh, go down to this pulley down here and stick it on one of the pulleys, uh, it works just fine. Even though the pulley is white also, uh, it's a little dirty and it's, it's, a, it's a very matte pulley and, this, uh, and it seems to read just fine off of that. So that's what we use to take the measurements. They are accurate measurements because as you'll notice, my lower pulleys and my, uh, and my uh, uh, upper drive pulleys are exactly the same size. So if I'm going 2000 RPM on the lower pulley, my disc is spinning at 2000 RPM as well, only because the pulleys are exactly the same size. So there's that. Uh, so now uh, let's get to doing some current readings. All right, we're gonna move some of this stuff off the table that we don't need. And uh, we'll have a good look at my machine. As you notice, uh, machine has a front and a back. 
and I got all these uh, electronic contraptions on the table. Uh, this, this is the DC motor. It happens to be an, uh, a three inch amp flow E30-150 motor. It's about an $80 motor. I really like it, but it's DC. And the reason it's DC, because I like to run this machine off of uh, lead acid batteries a lot. I used to run it off, it's a 12 or 24 volt motor. I used to run it off, off of one uh, or two uh, uh, lead acid batteries for AGM uh, batteries as well, worked just fine. Uh, I started using this 24 volt 10 amp switching power supply instead, so I don't have to recharge the batteries all the time. Uh, and I never got around to putting everything in a box it should be. Uh, this device here is simply a uh, power meter. It's, a, it's an LCD uh, digital power meter uh, with a 100 amp shunt over here. Uh, I use that just to see how much uh, electricity I'm putting in and how much power I'm, it's ta I'm taking to run my machine at various speeds uh, for a certain of the experiments I'm doing. On the right here, the thing that looks like just like the power supply, only smaller, is actually a uh, 60, uh, I think it's a 60, uh, is it a 60 amp? Yeah, probably a 60 amp uh, pulse width modulator. I use it for speed control. So with this little potentiometer here, I can adjust the speed of my machine, as you can see. I can speed it up or slow it down. This particular model, for some reason, when I get to the higher settings, it actually doesn't go fast. It goes, slows down a little bit. It's probably not the greatest uh, pulse width modulator, but it works. It works. So we're going to use that for speed control, uh, and now we're going to start taking some current readings. We're not going to uh, measure the speed yet. We're just going to take a few current readings. So let's go back to the front of the machine here. Okay, there's the machine. Let's turn it on. Okay, as you can see, the machine is running. Of course, you'll notice uh, I want to make sure I stress this. Take your capacitors off the machine when you do this. Uh, the instantaneous current you can get out of even your laden jars on a machine is enough to uh, very least melt the uh, enamel off your wires in your uh, analog meter. Uh, if you're using capacitors like I tend to put on this thing, you'll actually physically explode the wires that you have on your machine. So. Uh, and plus, even if your uh, meter could survive the uh, instantaneous current coming out of a, a discharging capacitor, um, it won't give you any useful information because it's the energy stored in the capacitor has nothing to do with the uh, current output of the machine. Uh, so again, get the capacitors off the machine. Uh, a lot of people have machines where they have a lever and they could uh, kick in and out the late enjoys just by moving the lever. That's fine if it actually does remove your uh, capacitors from the machine. A lot of the uh, commercial machines you have out there, the center uh, electrode of your late jars are still connected to your high voltage leads of your machine. All the little lever does is disconnects the uh, outer plates of the uh, uh, late jars from each other. And what happens uh, is the uh, capacitors tend to charge slightly even though the plates are not physically connected uh, and uh, it'll throw your readings off. I don't know if it'll destroy your meter like it would if it had taken their full load, but uh, in those cases, you actually want to take those uh, capacitors completely off the machine. Uh, so if you cannot really, really physically remove it from the circuit with your levers or whatever connection uh, switches you have, get the capacitors off the machine before you do any of this stuff. So now uh, let's take some current readings. We're gonna start off relatively slow. And see if we can push it back a little bit. Okay, 
and uh, I'm lucky that the machine is running in the correct polarity. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but I'm getting about, uh, at this speed, I'm getting about, uh, looks like 300 microwaves, a little under 300 microwaves. Because this uh, is a, what, a zero to two milliamp meter, and each graduation happens to be 100 microwaves. I'm getting at this speed is about 300 microwaves. And we'll see if we can get in there. I don't know if you could have seen that, but uh, get in the meter a little better so you can see if we can get a reading off of that if I'm not blocking it. And actually, I should zero the meter out a little bit. But here it goes. Again, we're getting close to 300 microns, maybe a little less because it's not zeroed out. Uh, actually, actually getting more. We're getting, uh, looks like about uh, 250 microns. I'm sorry, uh, each one is 100, so it, uh, I got halfway between the 500 marks, so it's about 250 microamps we were able to get out at that speed. Uh, again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go see if I can zero this guy out. There's a little adjustment screw on these where you can set your zero. See if I got a screwdriver here, I can do that better. Okay, here's the screwdriver. Let's see what we can do. That's about zeroed. Let's see what we get again. So we're getting a reading, and it looks like uh, 250, about uh, 300 microamps, I say. Each one being 100, uh, is it 100? I might be off here, uh, there's 10 in the middle, so. Uh, We're going about 250, each one is about 50 microamps, I'm sorry. So we're going about uh, 300 microamps exactly, if each graduation is 50 microamps. So there's 10 graduations between the zero and the, uh, and the uh, 500 microamp mark, so each one is 50, I said it was 100, I said 50. So the machine at this speed is producing about 300 microamps on the dot. We'll turn up the speed a little more and see what we get. Now we're getting at this speed, uh, we're getting almost uh, five, six, seven, about, about uh, 350 microamps. Actually, I'm sorry, it's, it's uh, 5 and 4. Yeah, about 350 microamps we're getting out of it. We'll turn it up even farther. That's 500 microamps even at this speed. Now one thing about the connections, uh, 
you do not have to physically uh, touch the uh, leads to the uh, to the high voltage terminals. You could put uh, sharp points. In this case, I just have the bare wires, which have enough sharp points on them. Uh, I could uh, just let the corona go from the machine to the points of the wire, and that's usually good enough. Uh, you know, see, see what it is. You could you could also put like a comb on the end of them and and, and take your current off uh, that way. And I'm going to show you right now. You could also take current readings from either of the high voltage sides to the ground on a polarized meter like this. You just got to make sure you get your polar polarity right. So the machine's running again. Now we're gonna to try to take current readings from one of the poles to the ground. So I'm going to the neutralizer now. So one, pole, one, one, is, one wire is on the neutralizer, one wire is on the ground. And I'm getting about uh, 250, 300, about 300 microamps out at that speed going from the uh, uh, one pole to the ground. Let's try both poles again. Same speed. And roughly, it's roughly, it's slightly more. You get a little tiny bit more when you go uh, dead short, but it's not much more than you get going to the uh, neutralizers or going straight to a ground. Uh, as you notice, sometimes uh, this happens a lot with these uh, meters when you uh, when you do these rings. A lot of times they'll get stuck where they are for a little while. Sometimes just shorting them out will help. They tend to act like capacitors sometimes and store a charge, uh, even when it's dead shorted with a cap. Maybe that cap actually got loaded up. Happens quite a bit. I haven't destroyed any meters like that, but it happens all the time. Sometimes you just gotta let it settle down. Again, shorting the leads usually helps. Taking it away from the machine for a second helps. Uh, now you see we're back to zero. So we're gonna start taking some uh, tachometer readings and see if we can get to the 2000 RPM and see uh, do we get near our 600 or 616 uh, microamps that we're supposed to be able to get out of this box. So let's move the camera over here to the side of the machine because we're going to be taking the RPM readings from the uh, second pulley on that five pulley block down there. Second pulley from the left, that's where I put my little sticker on. Well, I'm going to turn the machine off for a second so you can see the little reflective sticker. So there it is, you can see it, it's right on top of the, the little brass neutralizer holder. Right over there. And that's a little, uh, basically a one by one centimeter piece of the strip, that's pretty much all you need to, uh, as you can see, it's much brighter, much more reflective than the dull blackening uh, white pulley, uh, 3D printed pulley is. Uh, and so we should be able to re read the uh, uh, speed of that pretty easily. So here we go. Now the way these meters work, if you turn them on, they typically have a little laser light that comes out and it's reflected back and that's how you get a tachometer reading. Let me uh, clear this because it has a previous setting in it. Let's see if we can get it clear. And we'll clear the minimum and max just for the hell of it. And it's all clear. Should be ready to go. Let's start the machine going.
There it is. Uh, we're slightly over to 2,000 RPM. I don't know if, uh, let's see if we can get that on camera. Uh, let's see if I can get that on the camera. Two th uh, so this is the last uh, RPM reading we got, slightly over, about 2,060 RPM. Uh, so we're going to go with that for now. We're going to see what our current reading is. It should be over 600 uh, microamps. And as you can see, I was only getting about 500 microamps out of it at, uh, at roughly 2,060 RPM. And that could be a lot of reasons. Uh, one of them is maybe if I take these apart, so they're not shorting each other out. There we go. I took the electrodes apart and I got way over... Uh, I don't know if you saw that, but I got way over the 600, and I also got a, uh, I got an arc inside the meter. So, uh, it's shorting to the meter, that's part of the problem here, with these small, uh, see I'm, get, I'm, I'm getting readings off of it right now, it's not hooked up to anything because it's picking up high voltage, because Corona's spinning out all over the place. And there it is, there's my 600 on the dock, 600 on the dock. Uh, again, we'll, we'll do it. You see it's picking up all over because, like I said, the table's not really at ground, as you can see. And also the machine itself is picking up, probably from the uh, wire in the capacitor there, it's picking up right from the high voltage side. Let's get it to the middle a little bit. And again, we're back to 600. So as you can see with the tiny meters, there is a there is a little bit of problem. Uh, you know, they do pick up uh, so they do pick up a little bit of uh, corona from all over the place, and you gotta basically uh, insulate them as much as possible from the high voltage. Maybe make a uh, Faraday cage or something around them. But it does work, and the machine is running at just about 2,000 RPM, a little faster and it is definitely getting 600 microamps out, so our calculations are correct. The machine is certainly producing, and the machine is not at its maximum speed. Uh, I don't know if you noticed when I was adjusting the speed on my speed controller before, I got to the very setting and it actually slowed down, it didn't speed up, I had to back off a little bit. So again, that might be an issue with the type of PWM that I'm using to control my motor speed. But again, uh, over 2,000 RPM, just slightly, and we're getting actually slightly over uh, si uh, the 600 microamps out, just as uh, I said we should. Hi, so to conclude the video on taking current readings from your machine, as you see, we had the machine just slightly over 2,000 RPM, and we were easily getting 600 microamps out, probably more, but uh, the meter has only so much resolution. It's an analog meter. Uh, one of the things I need to clarify is that I, I was talking about belt generators and you'd need probably a smaller capacity meter to uh, test belt generators. I repeatedly said Wimshurst machines are low current devices and you need uh, the lower capacity meter to get the resolution you want. 
uh, I meant Van de Graaff generator. Uh, when I'm talking about belt generators, especially narrow belt generators, I mean Van de Graaff style machines, not Wimsers machines. Wimsers machines, especially motorized ones, are fairly high current devices, uh, not far off from what you get out of the Benetti machine. Less than what you get out of a Benetti machine, but certainly in the hundreds of microamps when you're dealing with a motor and not the uh, barely 20 or, or lower that you typically get out of even three foot tall uh, uh, typical Van de Graaff machines. So uh, it's the Van de Graaff machines that are typically extremely low current devices and not Windsor's machines, uh, just to clarify that. Uh, I'm not sure if I said anything else that was wrong but uh i'll clarify that later on if i did but uh again the low current devices are typically your van de Graaff generators and they're the ones you might need a lower capacity meter to get enough resolution to read it i know a lot of people that have fairly big van de Graaff generators they made and they're only producing five to six or eight microamps out of the things one guy was getting only three when he first built his so uh again typically low current devices and you don't really know what you're doing on them. You're not going to even get into the double digits. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Van de Graaff generators. Now wide belt machines, which is essentially wide belt Van de Graaff generators, totally opposite. You're going to get currents out of them equal to or greater than these types of machines. So keep that in mind if you're building these wide belt uh, Van de Graaff style machines that uh, you are going to need at least the size meters I have, maybe bigger on some of them. Again, if it wasn't clear earlier in the video, uh, I, I, I mentioned particularly when you're taking the high speed, higher current readings, get your uh, discharge terminals over here, get them far enough apart so they're not interacting. Uh, in a lot of the earlier current readings in the video, and when I started even taking the higher current, high speed uh, readings, you could see on the video the uh, sparks going across the two electrodes and probably even some of the corona on the video. Uh, you don't want that happening when you're doing the high voltage readings. The downside of having them apart so they're not interacting with each other uh, is that the machine starts kicking out high voltage wherever it can uh, a lot more aggressively. Uh, there was a, a, a part of the video where the meter was stuck and I talked about how to clear it when that happens. It actually wasn't stuck. The reason it was giving uh, quite a bit of reading there and was sticking around there is because uh, I don't have high voltage wire on that little capacitor I have across the two terminals, the little safety capacitor I have in there. And it was a little bit moved to the right side of my machine here. I don't know if you can see that in the video, but if you... If you, if you remember from the video, it was a little bit close, that uh, one of the leads on that capacitor, which is not high voltage wire at all, was actually picking up Corona off the, uh, the right high voltage terminal, and it, that was where the reading was coming from. So uh, it's gotta be centered. Even that thing, I probably should have, if I'm not using high voltage wire on it, I should at least have, uh, probably should have shielded that whole thing in waxer and uh, uh, actually sealed it in a a PVC tube so there's little or no leads sticking out uh, and completely sealed that away from reality so it's you know it's not a source to pick up corona because like I said all you really need to get current readings on those meters is a little corona off of uh, one of your high voltage electrodes so uh, so there's that just keep that in mind uh, I, I'm not sure if you saw it on video, I did talk about it in video, uh, when I started taking the higher current, the 600 microamp reading, there was a point where I got a uh, little purple lightning bolt inside the little cheap Chinese meter. Uh, the meters are tiny, as you can see, they're barely two by two uh, centimeters, uh, you know, they're a little bit rectangle, so a little bit longer in the length. but. Uh, little tiny meters and very thin plastic uh, holding them all together so uh, uh, you know that's an issue but again the meter was ba barely two dollars and fifty cents so and it worked quite well I'm quite surprised it works so well uh, typically the physically bigger the meter is the better that's why the Simpson uh, is actually better if you can get it even bigger than that one even bigger than that great uh, I've seen some really old ones that are really really big and really heavy duty cases on them. Uh, but 
the little cheap two dollar and fifty cent tiny meter did work. Uh, you just have to keep keep in mind, you really want to shield all the wires on it, including that safety capacitor I have in there. I didn't have high voltage wire. It starts picking up uh, uh, Corona off of the lead, and as you can see, this machine will kick out Corona really, really far. It was more than close enough to get a reading. I was getting a reading, and that's why it was kind of stuck in position for a while there. So uh, just keep that in mind and uh, play around, experiment. But as you can see, with a two dollar and fifty cent meeting, meter, I got great readings, and the readings uh, almost exactly matched what the uh, mathematical calculations told me the maximum limits of this particular machine are at that speed. So all in all, it was a success. Uh, again, play around. Keep in mind you want to shield those wires as much as you possibly can. Uh, they'll pick up Corona and you'll get erroneous readings otherwise. And you did see that in the video too. So have a good day. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.